Let's just do this. I want to I just go backwards a little bit before we go forward. Um, last week we started a, a message series called Church 316. We're, we're just studying through the, the 316s of the Bible. Uh, there's some powerhouses there. I found that as I studied through them that there's a, there's a, there's a blueprint there. There's, a, there's, this, there's, this, there's this golden strand, if you will, that for, for God's people, how to, to, you know, to, to, to be the church, to be the, the called out people, the ones that are following Jesus. What does it look like? What, how do we do this thing called church? Who are we? What is it supposed to look like? You know what I'm saying? Like, so if you have questions about what in the world we're doing, you go to the 316s and you can find this, this clear path uh, to, to, to what the church should look like, how it should operate. But what we did last week is, it was we took off on this journey. We put, went up on the airplane, but some of you were not here. And so I want to uh, make sure that you're not left on the tarmac. I want to make sure you get up on that plane with the rest of us so that we can go on this journey together. So just going to back up a little bit before we continue on in the journey. Last week, we talked about this. We said that, that if Jesus called us to be part of the church and to go do something, that, and really it's not just a part-time job, right? Would you all agree? Je- Jesus didn't call us to, to, to take a part-time gig. He called us to a full-time gig, really. And so before we jump in with all of our resources, not just money, but like all of our resources, our intellectual capital, our experience, our time, our attention, our priorities, and our cash, whatever we do, we need to know beforehand, like, who is this God? Who is this God that asks this of us? Because I need to know, like I don't want to waste my time, right? I need to know that I'm investing myself into something that's worthwhile. So last week we studied a little bit about who God is. Before we studied about the church, we want to find out who the pastor of the church is. We want to find out who the leader of the church is. And so we studied about who God is before we study about who the church is. And we just kind of just hit the high points. And we, we found out that God is a seeing God. That he's actively seeking to, 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 to look into our lives and see what's going on. It says in, in, in Second Chronicles, he says, that the eyes of the Lord go back and forth across the earth looking to strengthen those whose hearts are fully fully committed to him. So we see he's actively seeing. We know that he hears the prayers that please him. So we know that he sees. We know that he hears. We know that he knows everything that's going on in our life. He acts on our behalf. But here's the the thing that takes the pressure off. He acts on his, he acts on our behalf for his own namesake. So, so, so he'll do things for you to protect his own reputation. So it kind of takes the, you can almost exhale, you know what I mean? You can exhale because it's not, his, his blessing in your life is not based on your performance. It's not how good you are, how much scripture you read, how much you give. It's all based on his reputation. He does things for his namesake, so it takes the pressure off. We know that he, that he loves us. How much does he love us? Remember last week, how much? He loves us what? A whole bunch. Kind of, yeah. He loves you what? So much. Remember that? He loves you so much. Remember I talked about that? Like I'll, I'll go up to my wife and say, honey, I love you so much. But I'm certainly not going to go up to Marcus and go, Marcus, I just love you so. That'd be weird. That'd be really, really. I love Marcus too, just not that much. That'd be a little bit weird, right? We love, but, but God so loved everyone. Like, I, I reserve that for my wife because she's my one and only. I love her more than anybody else. But God said that about every single person. He loves the world so much. That's reserved for every single person he loves. He's a God that loves. We know that he's a God that's compassionate because compassion means that you see the hurt. You see the, the, the weakness. You see the fear. You see the hunger. And you're inspired to come alongside and do something about it, Right? So we know that God is compassionate because he loved us, what? So much that he sent his son. He did something to alleviate our greatest hurt and our greatest need. He sent his son. We know that he's a generous God because he sent his one and only begotten, his his monogenous, his unique one. He's Like I said before, if you had a million dollars and I gave you one, it's not a big deal, right? What if I only had one dollar and I gave it to you? That's a big deal, right? Well, there's only one Jesus, amen? And God sent his very best because he's a generous, generous God. And we closed last week with this thought. He's a seeing, he's a, he's a hearing, he's a knowing, he's a acting, he's a loving, he's a compassionate, and he's a generous God. And if the Lord is God, then follow him. 
Right? And so that's the, that's, the, that's the marching orders of the church. He's like, I'm going to have a church, and I want you to follow me. And if he really is the Lord, if the Lord is God, then follow him. Go all in on his church. Go all in. And that's where we find ourselves. Who thinks God is worthy of following? Amen. Yes, yes. He's an amazing God. He's an amazing God. And we should follow him with our whole heart. So this week we'll talk a little bit more about the church. Now I don't know about you, but I have little babies at home, Jameson and Jackson, and they're sick tonight so they couldn't be here. Meredith's sick. It's just totally creepy crawler through my house. It's disgusting. There's more boogers there. I, it's just beyond me. It's totally gross. So, 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 so I, but I have, I have little kids, right? And so uh, I don't know what you guys watch, but you guys know what I watch. Lion King. Yeah, I watch The Lion King. Nemo, Nemo yeah. You got all that stuff, right? I don't know. I bet you, like I said, I don't know what you're watching, but I'm watching constantly. You know, these kids, that's, that's all they want to watch, the same movie over and over again. It's so boring. But every single time you put on The Lion King, they're like, you know, like it's the first time they've ever seen it. It's amazing, right? So anyway, so, so, so we're using The Lion King as an example, but you know, it's true, like I I, like, I don't know, there's a lot of preachers in this world, and they get inspired by different things, but, but that's what inspired me this week was the Lion King. That's pretty pathetic, you know? It is, it, it, it's pathetic, but, 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 but that's what's in my life, right? So, so that's where I get my stuff, right? And, 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 and so, Hakuna Matata. It means what? No worry, you know, it's biblical. It's biblical. Paul said to worry about nothing. He even said that, that all things are going to work out for the good to those who love the Lord. What's that mean? Hakuna Matata. So we could use this. We could use this. I found about the church that, 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 that the church is to be uh, the water hole. The church is the water hole. You remember that, kind of the beginning of the movie when, when, when Simba is going to go with uh, uh, Nala? And they're going to go to the every, uh, elephant burial ground, but they, they lie. And they say, Mom, we're just going to the water hole. And, and they show the water hole, right? You guys have all seen, like, you know, maybe you saw Lion King, but you've seen the movies. You've seen National Geographic. You know what I'm talking about. There's the water hole. There's the water hole, right? And, 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 and everyone gathers there. That's where life is, right? Let, let me read this. We're, we're going through the 316s, right? Do me a favor. Jump to the first one. It's uh, 2 Kings 316. Go there for a second. Go there. We're going to talk about the water hole for a little bit. We're going to talk about life. Let's talk about life. Second Kings. It's up there. There we go. Awesome. I don't know if I got the page right, but you never know. It's ish. Second Kings 3.16, right? The church is a water hole. You're going to see in these verses that we share tonight a clear picture of what the church, the, the people of God should be like. There's a lot of negative out there about the church, right? I mean, people don't like the church. You, 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 you can go online and you can see video after video and testimony after testimony of why people don't go to the church. But listen, what we want to do is we want to be a church that's biblical. We want to be the church that's beautiful, that's attractive to people, not the, not the church that, that sends people packing. So let's read this here. You can see, um, I'm reading out of the New Living Translation, and, and hopefully you got a Bible. If you don't, there's some orange and yellow ones there, and the page is up there. You can go there and check it out. Okay, so, so, so here we are in, sec in 2 Kings chapter 3, verse 16. Um, so the harp is playing, and Elisha, he's a prophet, right? And he's saying this. He says this. He said, this is what the Lord says. He says, this dry valley will be filled with pools of water. And, and I don't know about you, but I want to invite you to do this. When you read the Bible, I want you to visualize what you're seeing. Because it doesn't become a reality until you can first see it. So I want you to see it first. I want you to imagine with me for a moment the water hole. I want you to imagine with me for a moment what this says, that, that in this dry and barren land, that's in, that right there in the middle will be this water hole, this source of life for all things. Like every single thing will come there to find life. Even the crocodiles that are in it, that are, that are killing, that's life for them. Do you see? Everything about the water hole is life. Water is life. You know you're 98% water. Without it, you shrivel up like a raisin. 
that everything in the whole desert, everything around it comes there for life. And, and, and to me, that's exactly what, what, the, what the church should be. It should be a central point of the community, a, 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 an oasis, if you will, in the desert. An oasis, right? Do you know how towns used to start? Like, I don't know about now, but, but, but if you do a little research historically, what they would do is the first thing that happened was they'd build a church. And then they would build around it. See, now what they do is they build a golf course and they build around it. But what they used to do is they'd put a church in and they'd build around it. There was the center, it was the heartbeat of the town, of the community, was the church of Jesus Christ. And so when Jesus, back in Matthew 16 and 18, when he says, I will build my church, my ecclesia, you know what that is? That's a gathering. That's an assembly. That's a congregation. I will build, like it's, you're called. It's not, so, and I know everyone talks about being called out, but listen, listen to the word. The word is the gathering, the congregation, the assembly. You're not called out, you're called together. You're called together to be a part of something together. He, he says he's gonna build, he's gonna build a, 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 an oasis in the center of this dry land. And, and the very presence of the church, the presence of the gathering of God's people will bring life to the community that it's in. This is the water hole. This is the church. Now, I wanna point out a couple things in this text to you that are crucial. I want you to be painting a picture, much like she's painting right now. I want you to paint a picture in your mind when the scripture speaks to you what it should be like. Listen, here's a couple things about this, these verses. I want to read, I want to continue reading on. 316 says, I'm going to, I'm going to take this dry valley and I'm going to fill it with pools of water. Verse 17, you will, you will see neither wind nor rain, says the Lord. But this valley will be filled with water. You will have plenty for yourselves and your cattle and other animals. But this is only a simple thing for the Lord, for he will make you victorious over the army of Moab. So here's a couple things. You'll see it there. The first one is that there's more than enough. That the church is more than enough that's needed to bring life to the entire community. See, the water hole should be uh, where, where everybody comes. See, that's probably photoshopped. That's probably photoshopped. I don't know if that would ever happen in real life. But for our argument's sake, we're going we're gonna to believe that that's real. I think that line would tear him up right now if that was the case, right? He may have just said. But, but, but you see, the, the, the water hole is for every single person for for every ethnicity for every tribe tongue and nation that every single person is welcome and there's enough for everybody the church will provide life for everyone in the community every single person in the church has gifting and talent and resource and much like the book of acts you see that all the people believe that nothing they had belonged to themselves and they would sell their stuff so that nobody was in need. There was more than enough for all people, for everybody. We will have plenty, it says. We will have plenty. It's enough to bless the entire community. Here's another thing that, that you need to know, and, you, and, and if you've been in the church long enough, you know this is going to happen. Evil will try to kill the church. You know it. Evil will try to kill the church. Okay? Every day. The enemy, the scriptures say, and it's so true that he came to steal, kill, and destroy God's people. He hates us. He hates you, and he wants to see you defeated in every single way. And he hates God because he can't have his throne. The devil is a punk, and he's never going to get his throne. Never. And he's never going to take the throne away from the bride of Christ. We're going to sit there with Jesus and the devil can't stop it. So he said, I will build my gathering. It's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And guess what? The gates of hell will not prevail against it. See, the gates of hell, the gates of any city is where where, we're like, let's talk about hell. There's gates and all the hell stuff is in here. All the bad, the evil, the dark, the ugly, right? The demons. And they all want to come out of that city. They go through that gate. They come out and they wreak havoc on the church. And then the gates are where they also go out and they grab you. And they bring you back with them. 
And the Bible says here that the gates of hell will not prevail. Okay, that's not going to happen against Jesus. And if you look in this text right here, look at the wartime terminology in verses 18 and 19. It says, the gates of hell will try, but look what it says. It says, victorious, army, conquer, fortified, cut down, stop up, and ruin. Those are what the, that's what, that's what the church is going to do, right? The church is going to go and they're going to fight. And so the ecclesia, the gathering of people, they take on a wartime posture. We have to take on a wartime posture. You know, like when they, and the full armor of Christ says, stand firm. Like we have to take up a wartime posture. We gather, we assemble, we congregate to pray and to plan and to strategize and to encourage one another and to teach each other and to equip each other and to heal and help so we could charge the gates of hell and take the next hill for Jesus. Anyone with me? Amen. Come on. Amen. Now, how exactly will Jesus build this oasis, this water hole in the middle of our city that brings life? I gotta tell you that I don't really know. How many people have made plans before? How many times did God do what Mary just did? <laughs> right? Yeah, but he said, what did he say? I will, I will build my church. I will grow my gathering. I will grow my congregation, and hell ain't going to stop it. And so I don't know exactly what it's going to look like. Look at verse 17 of this text. Look what it says. There's going to be water, right? He's going to take this dry, dead land. He's going to make it alive. He's going to bring life to it. But look what happens. Like, if you're going to have water in the desert, wouldn't you think it was, well, it's going to rain then, right? It's going to have to rain. So we have our logic. We're logical people. We, we try to reason. Well, what's going to bring water? Well, what, look what he says. He says, you will see neither wind nor rain, but this valley will be filled with water. So my point is this. Don't expect, wait, 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 listen, wait, wait, we're, he's going to do something here. But don't expect it to be the way you think it's going to be. Don't expect the expected. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, like listen, you, you, you can make your plans, but who directs your steps? But the Lord directs your steps. You, you can throw the dice, but who decides where they fall? The Lord, right? That's what the Bible says. It's so true. So, 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 so if God's going to do something, we can't expect, we can't figure out how he's going to do it, but he's going to do something because he promises there's going to be a, an oasis here because he's going to bring his church here. It's going to change. It's going to change. It's going to be life. How's it going to happen? Do we, do we just sit around and we wait? Listen, there are a lot of people talk about this. Oh, this drives me crazy. Someone get ready to say no. You ready? Some people tell, say it all the time. Well, we just got to wait on the Lord. You just got to wait on the Lord. So let me ask you, church, do we sit around and just wait? Because he's going to do it, right? He's going to do it. He's going to do it. He promised he's going to do it. So do we sit around? Do we sit around and wait upon the Lord? Somebody please yell no. <sighs> That's not a yell. Somebody, somebody yelled no. No, 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 no. We're not supposed to sit around, okay? So this is what we do, right? We gather. He, he gathers his saints around, right? So we could pray and we could plan and we could teach and we could praise him and all that stuff. And we got to dig some ditches. So we got to dig some ditches. What in the world am I talking about? There's probably only one person that I know of in this room that might know what I'm talking about. Jerome's a King James guy. Right, Jerome? He's a King James guy. See, if you're a King James guy, this verse sounds a little bit different. And if you're a New American Standard guy, it sounds a little bit different too. Yeah. See, he, 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 God says he's going to fill the desert with life. But, but, but look at you know what he says for us? He doesn't say this is what the Lord says. This is the one thing I love about King James. Thus saith the Lord, Elisha says. Thus saith the Lord, dig ditches in this desert. Dig ditches in this desert. You know what thus saith the Lord means? He said it's an order. He said go dig ditches. You know why? Because he's going to fill them. So we can't just sit around and wait on the Lord and say, okay, God, it's totally up to you. You do it. We're just going to sit here, and you're going to just pour down manna from heaven. We're, we're waiting on you, Lord. He says, no, go dig some ditches. 
Go, 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 go create some space for me to work, he said. Go give me a canvas that I could paint on. You see all these pictures? I brought these pictures up here for a reason. These pictures, they're beautiful, first and foremost. Absolutely amazing. This is what goes on in the church, right? Amazing. It's got another one going on right now. Every one of these pictures, not only are they beautiful, but they're ditches. They're ditches. Let me tell you what, what I mean by that. What's, every single one of these pictures, including the one that's being created right now, started as a vision. It was just a vision in someone's mind. God put, look, every good gift comes from God. You don't create anything on your own. Every amazing thing, that every thought that you have, every single beauty, it all came from somewhere. It's not from you. God gave you that thought. And so what happens is in, in the mind of the artist is a vision. But did they just happen? They didn't just happen, right? So, 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 we ha so you had to go to the store. You got to buy supplies. And you got to set it up. And then guess what? You got to actually put the brush to the canvas. Vision plus commitment equals reality. You see, you can't just sit around and hope that this is going to appear. You got to put your hand to the plow. You got to put your, your hand in the seed bag and start throwing it out. And so these are ditches, I'll tell you why, because when we get enough of them, we're going to have, like I said, we're going we're gonna to follow through on our identification statement, which means, which says that we're a gospel-centered, culture-creating community that brings beauty to the world. So this is a ditch, you know why? Because we're going to have an art exhibit, and we're going to invite the leaders from the city of Eustis to come and to see the beauty that is of Christ. Who's going to come? Oh, we're going to send out invitations See, we can send out the invitations, right? But who's going to come? Who's going to be inspired to come? I don't know. That's God's job. Who, who, who's going to see these paintings and, and rub elbows with some of us here at the church and, and, and going to be impacted by that? And how will they be impacted? I have absolutely no idea. I don't know. But we have to dig the ditches. See, we have, to, we have to get to work. See, our ditches are, are, are situations and environments and, and services and gatherings and programs and classes and conferences and seminars on parenting and marriage and finance and, and addiction recovery and worship and art and Bible study and ministry training. And we have to create relational settings and have events. Why? These are ditches for God to pour life into. You have to give them some space to work. Do you know what I'm saying? Does anyone hear me? Anyone? Life that recreates life. That's what he's going to do. All of you ever heard of uh, Elijah? The guy we're talking about tonight is Elisha. This is a, I'm talking about Elijah. Anyone ever hear of him? Mm -hmm. There's a story about Elijah. It's an awesome story. There's a... Uh, there's a lady, and her husband dies. Anyone owe any money to creditors? Come on now. <laughs> I'm not the only one. See, back in the day, they didn't just have annoying credit card people call your house and threaten. No, what they did is, like, if I owed John money, he would come to my house, and legally, he could take my children and work off the debt. That's what they, that's, that could happen. So there's this lady... And, and her husband has died, and she, she has nothing. So Elijah goes, the man of God goes to her. And he says, I want, you know, basically this, I want to help you. What do you have? Well, she has nothing. But what she does have is a little jar of oil. We'll use this. Because it doesn't tell you how big the little jar is, but it's a little jar of oil. So, so Elijah says, okay, God can work with that. It's a ditch, and I'm going to fill it with life. Watch this. I want you and your sons to go through the neighborhood, and I want you to go get a bunch of jars. And listen, do not get but a few. In other words, go get a lot of them. I'm about to rock your world. So they go out and they collect all these jars. And here's all the jars. Read the story. 
And all, here's all the jars, and they're lined up. And so what, what does Elijah do? He says, all right, give me that little, that little jar of oil. And he starts to pour. It's a ditch, man. This is, this is what we're talking about. He starts to pour this much oil into this big jug. And it keeps coming. Can you see it? Remember I told you to see? Can you see it? Can you see it? Can you see it? It's pouring out. And he fills this jar with this jar. And they bring him another one. Can you see it? He's filling another jar. And 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 another jar. Someone say it, another jar. But another jar. They keep filling up. And what happens? They run out of jars. And the second they brought the last jar and it was filled, what happened to the oil in the jar and the little one? Done. That's a ditch. See, God can take what you give and pour life into it. Do you see? Let me ask you a question. Who here in this room thinks, believes that if there were a hundred more jars, God would have filled every one of them? Come on. Yeah. Right, but we have to provide the space for God to work. We gotta bring the jars and not just a few to our Lord so he could fill them with life. And you know, I love this here in the text. It says, this is a simple thing for the Lord. It's like he's he's in his recliner when he's doing this. You know what I mean? This is no big thing for the Lord. Bring me jars, I'll fill them. Bring me people, I'll save them. The assembly of God's people is the water hole for the entire community. Okay, so let's do this. Let's close out 2 Kings 3.16 by saying this. That, that God will fill the ditches that we provide, and he'll provide an oasis to this desert. But you want to know how he's going to... We have to, we have to dig the ditch. But you want to know how he's going to fill the ditch with water? Look at John 7, 38. John 7, 38 is going to tell us exactly how this gets done. You don't have to guess. You just got to dig the ditch. Provide the canvas. Give him the space. And God will do it. And this is how he's going to do it. Jesus Christ says himself in in 738, we'll start at the very end of 37, he says this, anyone who is thirsty, who, 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 if in a desert, who's thirsty? Everybody, right? So, so, so let me ask you a question. Who in, in, in the golden triangle needs to have a relationship with God through his son, Jesus? Just let me hear that. Everybody, right? So, so when he says anyone, that's everyone who is thirsty may come to me. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink, drink deep. For the scriptures declare rivers of living water will flow from his heart. Now, 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 look at me, look at me, look at me. Don't keep reading, look at me. Who believes that? Yeah. The, 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 the flow of, of, of Jesus pouring out into people, yeah, yeah. But listen, this is where you come in, church. This is where you come in gathering. This is where you come in people. When it's, read on, verse 39. When Jesus said living water, he was speaking of the Holy Spirit. Let me, get, let me, just, let me just let you in a little secret. And it shouldn't be a secret because I scream it at you all the time. The same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. Amen. Okay? It says in Ephesians 1.13 that the moment of your conversion... Jesus Christ gave you his Holy Spirit. And he said that living water is the, is the Holy Spirit who would be given to everyone believing in him. So, the, so, so we're going to dig some ditches. We're going to create some space for God to work, right? And then guess what? He's going to use the same people who dug the ditch to pour his spirit out into the community so that they will know and love Jesus Christ. It's us, the bride who goes out and pours water into the ditches. He's going to use us to do just that. Amen? You're quiet tonight. All right, let's take a look at another 316. Go to Jeremiah 316. All 
I've been looking forward to, to this all week. <laughs> I love you guys. Thank you for letting me do this. So we look at Jeremiah 3.16 so we can find out more about the, the, like, who is this church. We want to get a picture of this church. We want to get a proper biblical picture of what the church is supposed to be. And that is our endeavor to be like that. Not what it's morphed into over the years. Not what people think about it negatively, but what we're supposed to be. This is where we find, we find this in the 316s. So let's go to, to Jeremiah 316 and we're going we're gonna to see a clearer picture of, of the church itself. Of the ecclesia, the, the called together people. Jeremiah. You ready? Are you there? Yeah. Okay, listen. And when your land is once more filled with people, says the Lord, you will no longer wish for the good old days when you possessed the ark of the Lord's covenant. You will not miss those days or even remember them, and there will be no need to rebuild this ark. In that day, Jerusalem will be known as the throne of the Lord. All nations will come there to honor the Lord. They will no longer stubbornly follow their own evil desires. Now, I don't want to ever make the assumption that we're all Bible scholars here. So I want to take a second and tell you what this Ark of the Covenant thing is. It's a box. It's a box. It's a very expensive box. And you're not allowed to touch it. Now, inside of this box was like some of that manna that came down from heaven. And, and the Ten Commandments were in there. Like, it's a, this is a special box. And, and, and on top of the box... There were these golden, little statues, you know, little statues of these angels. And their wings were extended kind of, you know, kind of like this or like that or whatever, you know. And, be, and, and between them is where God hung out. Now, that, that sounds kind of weird. And, and I, I say that, it does sound weird because, because I think that no matter who you are, if, you, if you're an Old Testament guy, if you're a New Testament guy, if you're Jewish, you're Christian, whatever denomination of Christ follower you are, I think we're probably all in agreement that, 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 that God, since the beginning of, of creation, was just, well, before that, was just everywhere. He's omnipresent. He's right here, right now. Look at this. He's there. He's there. Go in the toddler room. He's right in there. Right? No matter where you go, you can go to Ocala, he's hanging out there. You can go to Detroit, I don't know. You, you can go to anywhere. You can go to Nepal, you can go to, you can go to Kansas, you can go to, you can go to Canada, you can go to Germany. You, he's everywhere. Would you guys all, look, 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 do you all agree? Look, he's everywhere. You can't escape him, right? No matter where I go, Lord, I can't escape your, your spirit. The eyes of the Lord, remember? Eyes of the Lord. He's always looking. He's everywhere. So we all agree that he's everywhere, but here's the thing with the Ark of the Covenant. See, back in the day, uh, there's this manifest presence of God. So he's everywhere, right? We all agree. Everyone agreed, and everyone agrees here. But, 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 but between the angel's wings, it was his manifest presence, like a focused, that's where his power was. You know what I'm saying? Like, God's right. To, he's everywhere. But this manifest presence of God was right between the angel wings on top of this box. And that is kind of weird, but, but, but listen, it's true. He is everywhere, but there's scripture that says that he's, that he's close to the brokenhearted. So it kind of implies that when you're not brokenhearted, like he's there because we all agree that he's everywhere, but he's not like there, you know? Draw close to God and he'll draw close to you, which implies what? That if you're not drawing close to him, he's here, kind of here, but he's not like there. You know what I'm saying? There's no power there. And so what this is saying is, is that back in the day, he used to dwell He's to dwell above the ark. His manifest presence was there. As a matter of fact, it was so strong that only one dude could go in once a year and he was with, if he had any sin, dead. You can't get into that kind of power in that presence of that power and, and, and you like, whew, you know. Let me know what to say. But, but see, things have kind of, I don't know, they've kind of changed a little bit. They've transitioned. So he used to dwell between the cherubim, but then it kind of transitioned to a place, 
And God's people were there in Israel, so he was kind of, his presence was there. And so people would go there to, to be in the presence, like not just anywhere's the presence. Like, we're in the, do you know that you're in the presence of God right now? Should make you bow a little bit, you know? But, 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 but now it's different. See, it's transitioned from above the ark, like this, focused, laser-like power to a place, Jerusalem, and now it's different because you know what? Now his manifest presence is where Angela is. It's where Mary is. Wherever you go, that's where he is. And, and so we're not going to need to, to try to, 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 to go back to, a, to another way. Listen, his spirit is with you in a manifest, powerful way. Wherever you go, that's where he is. That's where he is. Do me a favor. Go to, to 1 Corinthians 3.16. Some of us still have books. Most of you guys have devices. I just like the book, man. I don't know. Is that because I'm old? Books are old. Books are always good. Always better. I tend to agree with you. But you can use your device. You can use your fake Bible. I'm just kidding. Look at this here, man. Don't you realize, there's some important verbiage in here. Don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God lives in you Look at what it goes on to say here, uh, the second half of 17. For God's temple, you, is holy, and you are that temple. Right? Listen, listen. <laughs> like, I don't even know how to wrap my brain around this. And I'm just like, just realizing it right now. There was this tabernacle with this ark, and there was God between the wings. That only one person could even walk into the presence of once a year. And that was iffy. And this is saying, that's you. That's you. That the Spirit of God is in you. You're the temple where he lives now. It's not above the, the ark between these two little statues. It's in you. It's in you. You're holy. You're special. The manifest presence of God is wherever you go. That's where he is. That's where he is. There's a, there's a, there's, there's a, there's a truth in verse 17 that you have to see. It says that when, when, when people go to where the throne of God is, where his manifest presence is, what does it say? They, don't, they no longer live according to their stubborn desires. You know what that means? It means that when, 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 when people are around you, they should change. Something happens to a person when they're around God. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, it's not just come to church and listen to a couple of good tunes. Like, when you're in the, we're in the presence of God, right? He inhabits the praises of his people. So there's a, there's a strong, manifest power that grows and grows and grows as God's people gather together to praise his name. He's there strong. And so when people are around that, their lives are transformed. Lives should, you should, you could come in as filthy and dirty and rotten as you want to be. But when you leave this place, you should turn out different. You should turn out different. You should go out of here different than when you came in. I want to, I want to point something out to you. Remember I told you there's some important verbiage there. It says that, let me go back to it. It says all of you, this is important, church. This is the ecclesia. This is the gathering. All of you what? Together. All of you together are the temple of God. The NIV says that the spirit of God lives in your midst. See, 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 when, 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 when you're all here, 
and we're praising the Lord. And that's, look, that's why Jessica and them, they encourage you to praise and praise loud. When, when you praise the Lord, he comes, he's here, he's stronger, he's stronger, he's more power, and you feel it. You ever walk into worship service and you could like, you walk in, just like, boom, you just feel his power hit you in the face when you walk in. And, and when God's people are gathered together and they're praising him, there he is and lives are transformed in the presence of God's spirit. Do me a favor, another one's important. You gotta get this. Go to Ephesians 2.20. There's something about when we gather people. I harp on it all the time about coming, but there's, it's important. It's important. You understand? It's important. If, 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 if you want lives to change, then you've got to be involved in that. God's presence is stronger and stronger and stronger when we're together. Amen? Listen. Listen here. Listen. For Christ himself, I'm sorry, I, I, I read the wrong thing. I read the wrong thing. 220, right here. To, oh, here's the first word. Together, we are his house. Built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, and the cornerstone, this is a good place for an amen, you ready? And the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. Amen. We are carefully, like it's not just a mistake that you walked in here. It's not a mistake. It's not like uh, I stumbled into Revolution Church. Listen, he, there's more to it than that. He's involved in stuff. Remember, he sees, he hears, he knows, he acts. Look, uh, he, 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 we are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Through him, you Gentiles are also being made part of this dwelling where God lives by his spirit. Listen, listen. There, there, there's a section in the, in the Bible, where, 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 the, where the Bible's talking about elders and deacons, right? And it says that the, that the deacon should, should be able to do certain things in, in the house that he dwells in. Like, in his home, his dwelling. You know what dwelling is? It's just where he hangs out. See, God used to hang out above the ark between the wings, and now what does he do? He hangs out in you, and he hangs out in you, and he hangs out in you. This is where he dwells. But what this is saying here is that, that, that the Gentiles are becoming part of this gathering, this congregation where God dwells. He hangs out here in a manifest, powerful way when we gather. Together. Not apart. No Lone Ranger Christianity. You're part of something. And so as we assemble and as we gather, as we congregate together... Then the, then the spirit will manifest itself stronger and stronger. And the more that come, the, the, the presence of God is stronger and stronger and more tangible. And you will see it and you will feel it and you will know it. And lives will change as en people enter into the presence of God. And they will find God where they find God's people. How will they find God? How will they find God? Well, if you look at uh, Jeremiah 3.22, it says this. You don't have to go there. I'll read it to you. My wayward children, says the Lord, come back to me. Come back to me and I will heal your wayward hearts. It's a plea for the Lord. It's a plea from the Lord. Well, how will people find him? How will people find him? Well, the vision of seeing a community transformed by the power of the gospel only becomes a reality when we begin, God's people, I'm talking to you, when we begin to, to realize and live out the calling that God has on our lives as a gathering of his people. Look in 2 Corinthians 5.18. 2 Corinthians 5.18. So I'm not just making this stuff up. It's actually, when I'm saying this, it's actually in the Bible. You guys all realize that if you're saved, if you're a Christian, you had nothing to do with it, right? It was a gift from God. Do you, all, do you all understand that? You didn't earn it. You weren't looking for it. You don't deserve it. 
Is God loves you how much? Oh, so much that he gave it to you. Verse 18 says that all of this, this love, this salvation, these gifts of his spirit, everything that you have, if you take a breath, it's from God. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. You all just acknowledge that. And God has given who? God has given us, us, hmm, given us this task. He's talking about the, the, the task of reconciling, the task that he sent Jesus to do. He was the first. And he went, and he went before us and he saved you. He seek and save that which was lost, right? And so now he says, now God has given us, the church, the gathering, his people, this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. We could, you, we, let me just pause there for a second. We could use that. That's a word for someone here. Not counting their sins against them, right? We all do that. We do, we do. So let's, let's try to do better. Listen to this. Keep going. Verse 20. So we are Christ's ambassadors. This is the part I want you to hear. God is making his, no, I'm gonna, um, mm, I don't like that word. I don't like that. God is making his plea through us. See, so when he says, oh, wayward children, come back to me and I will heal your wayward heart. See, he's calling out to the people, right? That's the, this is what the Lord says. Oh, wayward children, come back to me. Come back to me, right? But guess who is, guess what it's, it doesn't sound like God. Guess what it sounds like when, when people hear that? Oh, it sounds like Noreen. Oh, Yes. You're Christ's ambassador. He's making his plea through you. He's gonna, his, you know what his voice is gonna sound like? Frank. It's gonna sound like Nautica. It's gonna sound like Jessica. It's gonna sound like Jerome. It's gonna sound like Eddie. That, that, that's, who, that's who, when he makes his plea to people, oh children, come back to me. Guess what, guess what mouthpiece he uses? Jimmy's, Mandy's, Patrick's, mine. He uses us. He's given us the task of reconciling people. Look at this here. Look at it says. We speak for Christ when we plead the words that God just said. Come back to God. He uses us. We dig the ditches and we are the ones who pour out. Come back to God. Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we could dare ask or think. He uses us to dig the ditches. He uses us to pour into people. We're the living water that's coming out of our guts. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is in you. And you're, he's going to use you as his mouthpiece to pour living water into people so that this city can become an oasis in Lake County. Here's the last one. Who wants to be part of that? I want to be part of that. I mean, for real, right? I want to be part of that. Okay, here's the, here, here's the last one. Here's the last 316 of the night. And it's found in Joel. You can go there. Take a minute to get there. Um, the prophet Joel really, um, under the inspiration of God's spirit, he really gives us an understanding um, with greater clarity uh, of who we are and, and what God will not just wants to do, but will do through his ecclesia, through his church, through his gathering of people. As he gathers them more and more and, and we congregate together, we assemble together, that's us, that's you, that's, point, that's, that's us right here. And we see a greater picture here of what he wants to do uh, through us. So Joel 3.16, let me see if I saved it. I did, yes. Okay. You guys there? Now, now remember what I said earlier. When you read, don't just read the words. Create a picture in your mind. Let, let the words create a, paint a picture in your mind of what God's people should be, of what this oasis of life in the center of, of a dry and arid land would look like. So as we read this, let them paint a picture in your mind. The Lord's voice... And remember now what I told you. Whose voice is he using? Raise your hand. Oh, he's using our voice, right? The Lord's voice will roar 
from Zion and sunder from Jerusalem. What he's saying here is that where God is, you're going to hear it. High impact, right? High impact. And the heavens and the earth will shake when he screams through whose voice? Ours. But the Lord, just, you can hear it just downshift, right? But the Lord will be a refuge for his people. A strong fortress, and I'm going to say not the, for the people of Israel, but really for his people. For his people. It was back in, uh, I don't know, you know, my timing is terrible. <laughs> Probably 06, 07, somewhere in there. May have been in earlier. Sitting in my house that I'm in now. I was in my, you know, we don't have dining rooms. Nobody has a dining room, right? You have dining areas. So I'm in my dining area, <laughs> and, and I'm not much of a writer. And, and so uh, I just, I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden I just feel this, like, tug, like, go, go right. Go. So, so I'm like, okay. So I get up, and I go into the, into the bedroom, and there's a computer there. And I had this old gateway laptop, old reliable, but it's not reliable anymore. It's in the trash. I smashed it. It was so much fun. <laughs> it was so, I highly recommend that. Smash a computer. It's the best. So, 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 so I go in the room and I start typing. And, and, and oh, I don't know, an hour, hour and a half later, there's two, two pages, like almost, almost another half, so almost two and a half pages of this, of this thing that, that I wrote. And I, and, I, and I titled it, Your Kingdom Come. Some of you have read it. And, and what this was, and I didn't realize at the time, but this was God beginning to unveil to me a vision of, of, of not just the church, but specifically the church that I would be part of, hence you, and what it would look like and it was a vision that, that, that talked about a church that wouldn't be like tucked away in little nooks and crannies down like little side roads where no one knew where it was and, and, and you just come in and you, and you sing and you pray and you preach and go home and, and that was it. But it was a church that would reach into every facet of our society with the love of God and, 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 and to reach into every nook and cranny of our culture just involved in sports and politics, not to take a side, but involved in the political process and involved with health care and education, the public schools, the private schools, whatever, involved with all the people, whatever they needed, the church was there. And it wasn't stuff that we, that we did and decided to do based on, on a Democrat or Republican or, or financial reasons, but we did things out of a heart for God and, and for the love of God. And, and we did that because that's what Jesus does. And we were going to be that centrally located church where all all the city would know we were there and if they needed anything they knew who they could come to it would be Jesus Christ his people his bride and that this church wouldn't be some little thing because you know the tail doesn't really wag the dog and you know there's 300,000 people in Lake County it's crazy right you know there's like 17,000 people in Eustace there's a lot of people here and, 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 we, and we talked about it a little bit ago that, that how many people in this area really, really need a relationship with Jesus. You said every single one of them. So, so, so my, my, when I read this, I was like, yes, Lord, yes. That we were, we were to be a church that was, that was in a place where our building would make a statement as to who we were. And, and we would be in a location where people could find us. And we weren't begging them to come where we were, but we went to where they were. See, that was the biblical example. Jesus, Paul, they went to where people were. And, and that when we were there, that we would be high impact, like it says. That, that God's voice would roar and shake the heavens and the earth when his people spoke up. And that we would be an oasis to this community, but also be a place that provided peace and hope and love, and safety, and protection, and provision. And see, that's why it says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15, to look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. Because it's through his church 
that God's grace flows most freely. See, I've said this before that when there's someone in great need, more times than not, he'll put it on someone else's heart here to help that person. I know that when I am blessed, when I'm in great need and I cry out to the Lord, and I know many of you do, do you know it just seems like all the time I get blessed by people that I know in our church. His grace flows freely through his bride, through his bride, and that's what the church should be for our community. There's so many lost and hurting people here in our community, and as of this moment, like, let me ask you this, how many people in their own mind, in their own creative mind, have a vision of what the church could be? Raise your hand. And you don't have to, we don't have to spell it all out, but have a vision of what the church could be. That, that, that you, and I don't know about you, but I like, I, have, I don't have a number, but, but there's many, let's just call it many, there's many people that, 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 that change, that, that, that turn from their sin and embrace Christ by faith, and, and, and their, their lives are transformed, and they get off of their drugs and their alcohol, and they restore their relationships, and they stop doing the, the foolish things that they do time and time again, but they start to obey the Lord and follow His Spirit, and their life is completely different, and they become, instead of sinning like crazy, they're worshiping like crazy. I have that vision, right? I know I'm not alone. But here's the thing. Think about all those people right now that you would love to see come to Christ. Right now, they're nothing except a part of your vision. But what I'm seeing here in the scriptures, in the 316s, is that it is our gig to see that they transition from part of the vision into the reality. That's what I want to see more than anything. I want to see people just like all of you saved and changing, becoming more like Jesus every single day. Like, I'm not alone. I know that you all, I hope you feel that way. Oh my heavens, I hope you feel that way. I hope you feel that way. I want to see that happen so, so bad. Uh, as a matter of fact, it says, in, in, if you look back in Joel 3.14, it's a perfect illustration. He says this, he says, thousands upon thousands are waiting in the valley of decision. Eustace has 17,000 people in it. And I'm telling you right now, the vast majority of them are waiting in the valley of decision. God doesn't make any mistakes, amen? There's a reason why it says the valley. You see, we describe good things in our life as mountaintop experiences, don't we? The, the good things are the mountaintop experiences. Stay with me, stay with me. They're doing their thing, you do yours. They're in the valley of decision. You know why they're in the valley? Because especially here in the South, it's the Bible Belt. Everyone knows about Jesus, really. They know about him. And most of us know just enough to not be saved. Most of us know enough to be dangerous, to assume that just because they believe that Jesus Christ did go to a cross one day way back when to pay for sin, and because their grandmother went to church and their, and their mom went to church and their granddaddy prayed for them and showed them how to fix a 350 big block, that, that, that because they went to a church one day at a tent and they got down on the knee and said a prayer that, 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 that I'm good, but most of us know enough about Christ and have enough lesson in morality to be miserable. That's the valley of decision. It's a rotten place to be. Listen, listen up. Everyone, everyone knows that they're broken and hurting. Even the ones that don't admit it, they know. Everyone knows there's something wrong. That's why everyone's seeking for something that's transcendent, something that's bigger, something that's going to help. That's why they drink their sorrows away and shoot up. They look, in, they look for it in girls and men and money and stuff. Everyone's looking because we're in the valley of decision. And it's a low point because when you know that there's something wrong but you, can't, but you won't choose to fix it, there's suffering there. And, and there's so many in this valley. Do you know, I'm almost done. Do you know that this is crazy? That in 2010, Christianity Today, one of the most respected, well-read, 
uh, publications worldwide reported that the United States of America, the Christian country, received the most missionaries to its shores of any country in the world. Over 32,400 people in other countries looked at us and said, they need Jesus. And they're right. And we're in a place that's just like that. We're in a place that's just like that. But I believe with all my heart that God wants to use Revolution Church to shine light into the darkness of the valley of decision. I believe with all my heart that God wants our church to begin digging ditches in the desert so he can transform this community into an oasis of his spirit. The harvest is plentiful. Make no mistake about it. Because you live in Eustace, because you live in the Bible Belt, because you live in the South, because you live in America means nothing. 32,400 missionaries, who a lot of them live in huts and in dirt, looked at America and said, they need Jesus. And we're here. We don't have to go on a mission trip. You don't have to buy a ticket. You don't have to get a passport. It's right here. It's right here. I want to read a verse with you to close our night. Because I I believe that this verse will inspire you to go dig ditches. To be a part of what God wants to do here in Eustis, Florida, in the the Golden Triangle. And And the reason why I think it's going to inspire you is because I think that a lot of people, because we live here, we don't realize the the great need. But if the Bible was true when it was written, it's as true as it, as it was then as it is today. Do, do you agree? It speaks to us right now, right where we're at. And, and I want you to read this with me. I want you to read this with me, and then we're going to call, call it a night. You guys ready? Okay, come on, re- let's read this. But I say, wake up. Next week, let me ask you, how many people here are interested in digging ditches for the Lord to fill with life? Just show me your hand. Keep your hand up. Keep your hand. Awesome. Doesn't mean you have to grab a shovel. <laughs> I'm not going to ask you to grab a shovel. Just bait you guys in, right? <laughs> no. Listen, next week I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to introduce to you an amazing ditch that we as a family can dig together a a, a trench a riverbed where God's spirit can flow into this city it's just it's 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 a gateway into the city where God's spirit can flow into the city into the heart of our city and then be pumped out into every facet of our society here And, and if you're ready if you're ready to dig a ditch with me, a trench, not a little ditch, I'm talking about bringing jars by the thousands to, to, to the man of God, to Elijah, so that God could keep pouring out oil into it. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to introduce to you an opportunity for us to dig a massive trench in this city where God can make an oasis here. Amen? Amen. I love you guys.